What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. All right, so we have a 52-year-old right-handed man, and for neuro cases, it's very important to pay attention to if they give it to you, if they're right-handed or left-handed, because it can indicate which hemisphere of the brain is potentially the dominant hemisphere. And so right-handed people, the majority of them, their left hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere. So he presents to the emergency department. He has difficulty speaking. He has weakness of the right upper extremity and then drooping of the right side of the face. So you definitely, with these symptoms, want to be suspicious of a stroke, especially you want to pay attention to it's on both on the right side of the body and then the right side of the face. All right, so he's got a past medical history notable for hypertension, definitely a risk factor for stroke, and then atrial fibrillation. He was previously prescribed amiodarone, which would be for controlling the AFib, and then warfarin. So patients with chronic atrial fibrillation are typically prescribed some kind of blood thinner like warfarin because they're at risk for developing clots because atrial fibrillation is essentially a muscle spasm of the atria. And so if it's spazzing out and inefficiently pumping, blood becomes stagnant. And when blood becomes stagnant, it, it increases the risk of developing clots within the atria. And the problem with that is then it gets shot into the left ventricle and then shot out into the circulation. So however, he's non-compliant with his medications. So even though he was prescribed these to prevent the risk, so really what this sentence is telling you is that he has atrial fibrillation and even though he's prescribed these medications, since he's not taking them, he's still at risk for having atrial fibrillation and as a result of that, he's still at risk for developing clots in the left atrium. On physical exam, he's found to have three out of five strength in the right upper extremity, so that corresponds to the initial presentation. However, they also find that four out of five strength in the right lower extremity. So pretty significant weakness in the right upper extremity, and then also definitely some notable weakness here in the, in the lower extremity as well. So the whole right side of the body is weak, but the upper extremity more so than the lower. Five out of five strength on the left upper and lower extremities, so the left side of the body is intact from a motor standpoint. And then he has decreased sensation to light touch on, in the right upper and lower extremities. So the whole right side of the body is also having, experiencing some numbness. He also has expressive aphasia, which is likely due to his stroke as well. Now he has a head CT that reveals no intracranial hemorrhage. So an important thing to point out is when a patient comes into the emergency room with stroke-like symptoms, one of the first things that's often done is a head CT because there's really two types of strokes. There's ischemic which is where you have a blood clot in a vessel, similar to a heart attack, where you're preventing blood flow to uh, perfusing the brain. And so that's one example. And then there's also what's called hemorrhagic. And that's where they have a bleed inside the brain, inside the head. And since the head's you know, essentially a closed box, when you have fluid building up and building up, it can compress the brain and cause neurological symptoms. And so you want to be able to rule that out because one of the Treatments for ischemic is giving blood thinners, with specifically TPA, and so you don't want to give a patient TPA if they're actually hemorrhaging because it'll just make it worse. And so you need to know that before you would give TPA so patients will receive a head CT to confirm that. And so this patient has no intracranial hemorrhage. Ischemic strokes are definitely the more common example. So if we look at the question here, so we've got a you know, middle-aged guy, he's, got a, he's coming in with stroke-like symptoms, affecting more so the right side of the body. And so we want to know which of the following is the most likely underlying cause of this patient's condition. So what's pathology is causing these symptoms. And so if you look at kind of the answer choices, they have anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral artery as choices both for both of these. And so they're making you distinguish also, is it atherosclerosis or an embolism? Not only are they asking for you to localize the lesion, but also the underlying pathology. And so the way you want to handle a neuro case is you want to look at the presentation, so what are the, what the patient's complaining of, what their history is. The physical exam, especially in neuro patients, the neuro exam is very important. So that'll help you localize the lesion. So you essentially want to work backwards. You want to localize the lesion so to a particular area of the brain or spinal cord. And then from that, once you've localized it to the area of, of the nervous system, then you want to look for or determine 
the underlying pathology. And so really they're asking you to do both of these, localize and tell them based on the history, the underlying pathology. All right, so if we look at the major neurological findings based on the presentation and the exam, you look at motor, he's three out of five in the right upper extremity, four out of five in the right lower extremity. So the upper extremity is definitely more significant than the lower extremity. Sensory, he's got decreased sensation on both the whole, really the whole up right side of the body, both upper and lower extremities. Face, he's got what's called right-sided hemiplegia because he's got the drooping of the right side of the face. And then speech, he's got what's called expressive aphasia. So we'll go through what, where, how these, we, you can use these to help localize which artery is affected. So before you, re, you reach the artery, you really want to look at what part of the brain, because really, with this, sure, that it's caused by some kind of blockage in the, in the artery, but the arteries are supplying portions of the brain. So you want to find out which portion of the brain is affected and responsible for these, the areas that are affected with these symptoms, and then you trace it back to looking at the blood supply of the brain, and then you can figure out which artery. So if we look at this lateral view of the, of the surface of the cerebral cortex, you have what's called the precentral gyrus and then the postcentral gyrus. So the precentral is for motor. That's the, also known as the motor strip. And then the postcentral gyrus is for sensory. And they both have this kind of map called the homunculus. And so you'll see here more of the, this is a coronal view, and more so the medial aspect is the lower extremity. So this is more controlling of the lower extremity. And then as you can see here, when you get more lateral out this way, it's the you know, upper extremity and then the face in here. And so if you look at here, this is an inferior view of the brain here. You can see the internal carotid artery coming in here. Here's another view of it here. This is just stripping the brain away and looking at the arteries. So you have the ICA here. You can see the ICA comes in here and then it continues on as the middle cerebral artery. So you can see that here as well, continuing out in this direction, in the, sort of the lateral direction. So that's the MCA there. You also have a branch point here where you have branching from the internal carotid and essentially the internal carotid splits into the MCA and the anterior cerebral artery or the ACA. You can see that here. So the ACA travels more medially this way within the brain. And then back here you have the PCA or posterior cerebral artery, which comes off of what's called the basilar artery, which is an artery that's formed by the two vertebral arteries coming together. And then, and then they form the ba basilar artery, which travels up this the ventral surface here of the brainstem. And then the basilar artery splits into these posterior cerebral arteries here. One thing we'll show here, here's a sagittal view. So here's the ACA here and its branches. It's, as you can see here, it kind of fans out. Sometimes it's called like a mohawk dis distribution. And so it fans out here and supplies really this whole medial aspect of the brain. So this is a great diagram showing you the different distributions of blood supply in the brain. And so if you look here in the orange, this is the middle cerebral artery, which is this more lateral portion because it makes sense that the artery is going out more so this way. So this is MCA, which is controlling this, as you can see here. The medial aspect is more the anterior cerebral artery, and then back here in the occipital lobe is the posterior cerebral artery. So if we look at our homunculus here, the ACA is this more medial portion here. So if this is medial, this is lateral here. And then this portion out here is more so the MCA. So if you look at our patient, his upper extremity is more so affected than the lower extremity, and then his face is affected as well, and so that's going to be more indi indicative of an MCA. If his lower extremity was much more weaker or only weak, then that would be more so an ACA stroke versus an MCA stroke. PCA strokes typically more so present with visual defects because the occipital lobe is where the visual processing centers are. So our patient's symptoms are on the right side of the body, but if you have, you have to remember that these motor fibers, even though they, orig they actually originate on the opposite side because they do crossing over in the brainstem for the motor fibers. So this would be the left hemisphere, this would be the right. And so the left hemisphere fibers, they come down and then they cross over here and then they go down into the spinal cord and control the muscles on the right side. And then you have the sensory here where the fibers are coming in from the right side and then they cross over and then they make their way over here where they're processed on the left hemisphere of the brain. Lastly, we'll show this here. So this is Broca's area here, and you can see that it's in that distribution of the MCA. And so 
this patient has what's called expressive aphasia, which means they're able to process and understand language. However, they're not able to express language. So when they talk, it's sort of broken language and it doesn't make a lot of sense, even though to them in their mind it makes sense, they're not able to express it. And so that's hence why it's called expressive aphasia. And so as you can see, this Broca's area is in the dominant hemisphere, which in our patient, since he's right-handed, is going to most likely be the left hemisphere. And again, which seems to, given that our symptoms are on the right, our motor and sensory symptoms, it is also indicative of that the left hemisphere of the brain is being affected. And so again, this is corresponding to a left MCA stroke. So if we come back to the answer choices, anterior cerebral artery is most likely out because that would be more so lower extremity than upper extremity, which is not the case. What is the case is the upper extremity and then the face as well. So you have face, and this, the face is not so much as affected with anterior cerebral artery. There's not really any description of significant visual defects. And so that is out as well. And so what we have is obviously the face, upper extremity, lower extremity, and then also this expressive aphasia also indicates a middle cerebral artery. So now that we've been able to cross these out, now we have to determine based on the history, is it atherosclerosis or an embolism? So atherosclerosis would obviously be, you know, developing of an atherosclerotic plaque in the, within the artery over time. This patient doesn't have a lot of risk factors for that. Sure, he's got some hypertension, but he doesn't, it doesn't indicate that he has uh, hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol. Middle age, but really the cutoff where you start to really worry in men is 55 and older, and then in women it's 65 and older. And so he hasn't quite reached that, that age threshold yet. And so, I mean, it definitely could be possible, but we also what's really uh, worrisome is this history of atrial fibrillation. He's supposed to be on warfarin, but he's non-compliant. So if we look at this here, again, he's got a history of AFib. He's non-compliant with the warfarin. He's at increased risk for developing a thrombus here. The problem is in the left atrium, that gets you know sent into the left ventricle, and then that gets pumped out into the circulation, and so it can embolize and go up here and then go into the carotid artery, and then through the carotid artery, it can make its way to the cerebral circulation and cause an infarction. And so if we come back to the stem here, Again, based on the you know, neurological presentation and exam, we've narrowed it down to the middle cerebral artery. And then based on the history and his non-compliance with his medications, that leads us to it's an embolism of the left middle cerebral artery. All right, so a quick follow-up question to the same case here. So again, we have a left-sided MCA stroke. And so this question is asking, which of the following visual deficits could present with this patient's condition, meaning a left MCA stroke. And so I know we said that visual defects are more common for posterior cerebral artery strokes because that supplies the occipital lobe. However, MCA supplies certain regions of the visual pathways, and so that potentially they can also present with visual defects as well, but very specific ones, and we'll go through that. So first, let's go back to the distribution. So here's the distribution of the MCA here on the left side. And as you can see here, that would about correspond to this region here. And this is a nice diagram showing you the visual pathways here. One thing we'll point out here is that, so here's the retina. And so you, essentially the retina is kind of split into halves. And so you, you have quadrants of the eye like this. And so you have quadrants for both eyes. And so you have the left eye, the right eye, and so in the left eye here, you have a superior left quadrant, a superior right quadrant, an inferior right quadrant, and an inferior left quadrant. And then the same thing here in this eye, in the right eye as well. And so if we look at here, this region here is impacted by this left side of the eye here. This area of visual input is received by this side of the retina here. Same thing here. This is received by here, and this is received by here. And then as you can see here, the color of the fiber corresponds to the region of visual input. Now, if we come back to the answer choices here, we'll go through each of these de de deficits here. So this is what's called a superior quadrantopia because it's the superior quadrant, and a quadrant in, in black here is what's missing in the in the visual field, what the person's not able to see. This would be the left eye. This would be the right eye. This is actually a left-sided superior quadrantopia because it's the left here, the left here. It's the left in both eyes, as you can see here. And so if we come to our distribution of the MCA here, 
So what you have here is you have the optic nerve that comes from the eye. You have the optic chiasm where you have these fibers uh, crossing over. And then you have what's called, they don't show it here, the optic tract here. And then the optic tract brings the fibers here where they synapse in what's called the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then from there they split into what's really called the optic radiations. which is parietal lobe and then they also and then they split into Myers loop which is the temporal lobe and these are really are orthogonal or at a 90 degree together 90 degree angle and so Myers loop lesions there give you superior a contralateral superior quadrantopia so if Myers loop in the left hemisphere is affected, it's going to give you a right-sided superior quadrantinopia. So it can't be this for this patient because this is a left-sided quadrantinopia. Now, if we look here, if you have a lesion in the optic radiations, that's going to give you what's called here an in a contralateral inferior quadrantinopia. Now, this is a left-sided inferior quadrantinopia, and this patient's stroke is on the left hemisphere. And so it's not a contralateral, so it can't be this here, because if this patient were to have a contralateral inferior quadrantinopia, it would be a right-sided inferior quadrantinopia. And so it can't be that as well. So if we clean this up here, if we come here again, our MCA stroke uh, territory here, in the optic tract, since the fibers haven't split yet into those, into that optic radiation and Myers loop, you're going to have both the superior and the inferior quadrant affected on that same side. And so since this is on the left side, and so if you have a lesion here, it's going to affect both the superior and inferior quadrant on the right side, both here and here on the right side and the right eye as well. And this is what's called a contralateral hominous hemianopia. And so this would be a, or a right-sided hominous hemianopia on this side because it's the right half of the eye and for both eyes. So this is looking like our answer choice, but let's just go for completeness sake for the, through the last one. So the last one here is an interesting one. This is what's called bitemporal hemianopia and also known as tunnel vision because if you look the outer visual fields are affected. And so this patient, you know, can really only see in here and this is blocked out here. And what's responsible for these outer fields here are actually these inner portions of the retina here because you can see here, here's the outer portion here and then for the retina here and as you follow the fibers down this crosses over here this red fiber crosses over here this is what's called the optic chiasm this is where they are uh, crossing over and so really a bitemporal hemianopia is actually caused by a lesion impinges on the optic chiasm itself because it's presented preventing these crossing over of these fibers coming from these portions of the retina that receive these outer visual field inputs. And so that's what gives you tunnel vision. And so since this isn't really a part of the MCA distribution, it's not likely that this is affected as well. So again, we come back here to the answer choice. The answer choice is C, a right-sided hominous hemianopia or contralateral hominous hemianopia. All right, that's all I have for you this week. Make sure you check back every Wednesday for new Da Vinci cases. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel for more videos, and then be sure to download the PDF notes for this video on our website at dviacademy.com. Also on our site, you can find our book and video packages for anatomy and biochemistry. And if you want to listen to DaVinci Cases on the go, the audio is available on Spotify. You can also follow us on Instagram for weekly posts and video. And then lastly, if you have any questions about the content of this video or about the Vinci Academy, put them in the comments and our team will be sure to answer them. All right, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.